Boston, 1770. 1,000 British troops occupy this city of 15,000. It is a volatile brew. Boston is an accident waiting to happen, literally. Conditions are ripe. We've got an indigenous population that is very, very sensitive to having British soldiers quartered amongst them. You have all of these British regiments in Boston. This is something that, that the Bostonians simply chafe under. Resentment grows against the soldiers in Boston streets. On the night of March 5th, a band of local patriots heckles a British sentry standing guard at the customs house. At first, they merely hurl insults, but soon they're hurling snowballs, and eight more soldiers come to the aid of their comrade. You have a group of men who are egging on British soldiers looking for ways to kind of stir up a fight. And now they've created the antagonism that they've been trying to gin up. Hundreds more colonists pour into the street. They launch a barrage of ice, oyster shells, and rocks at the soldiers. The guards panic, their guns go off. And when it's over, Five civilians lay dead on the frozen street. It was a tragically predictable sort of event. It's one of those situations in which the soldiers that are there to impose order are actually that seed of discontent that's going to produce disorder. Within hours of the deadly shootings, the Patriot spin machine roars into high gear. A tragic accident is recast as a murderous crime against the colonial people in what becomes known as the Boston Massacre. This was not remotely a massacre. This was a case in which a mob assailed a small detachment of British soldiers, which may have panicked but had very legitimate cause to fear for their well-being. But that's not how it's portrayed to the outside world. A local silversmith and artisan named Paul Revere renders an exaggerated version of the event that makes it look like an unprovoked slaughter by the British soldiers. Boston papers are quick to print and distribute Revere's version. And this becomes the Patriot image of the Boston Massacre, which shows the British lined up in a row, firing their muskets all at once, as if they got the command to fire, which didn't happen that way. The first to die in the gunfire is a black man, a sailor and runaway slave named Crispus Attucks. He is widely viewed as the first martyr of the American Revolution. In this explosive atmosphere, the public outcry pressures the British to pull their troops out of Boston. The soldiers responsible for the so-called massacre are put on trial for murder, and they are hard pressed to find an attorney to take their case. Surprisingly, one of Boston's most vocal patriots steps forward, John Adams. Adams is willing to risk everything, his and his family's safety, and his reputation as an ardent advocate of colonial rights. But he believes passionately in the right to a fair trial. Without human rights, the patriot cause isn't worth fighting. It was one of the best pieces of service I ever rendered. Judgment of death against these soldiers would have been a foul stain upon this country. John Adams. Adams wins an acquittal for seven of the soldiers and light sentences for the other two. Only his unquestioned devotion to the Patriot cause keeps him from being branded a traitor. The crisis is resolved for now.